Howdy, this is Mackenzie Franklin from Side Game LLC here in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Hidden gems, call them what you like. These are 10 board games that I think you probably haven't heard of. This topic has been on my mind recently because I've been playing a lot of games with my friend Dan, who has a huge library of games that I definitely have never heard of, and a lot of them are older titles. I'm lucky enough to get to play these, and not all of them are hits for sure, several misses, but you're going to see plenty of those games on this list as games I think people need to hear about, and I think that you'll have a great time with. In particular, number one is the most recent of these and was able to find a copy for the library for relatively cheap. So you can definitely skip there if you want, but oh my gosh, these games are a blast and I think that you gotta give them a try. If you haven't subscribed to the channel already, please make sure that you do. It's the best way to help us grow. And for those of you already subscribed, thank you so much for the continuous support. With that being said, let's get started with the video with the top 10 board games that I think that you probably haven't heard of. If you have heard of these, let me know down in the comments below and what you think of them. Starting off, we want to do a quick honorable mention here, and that's going to be Capital X 2 Generations. I've talked about this a bunch on this channel, so I don't think I quite made this list, but I think that this is one of the best games out there, period. It's in my top 10. So this is one that you need to give a try if you haven't already. Capital X 2 Generations, a quick honorable mention, because it should appear on this list, particularly if you're new to the channel. Starting off the list with number 10, we have Heroes of Tenefer. This is a deck-building game where you and your party are going to be going through dungeons, leveling up by defeating enemies, and adding those enemies to your deck as cards. A game flow has you reveal revealing cards from your deck three at a time, and you have to decide then and there if you want to keep this hand of cards to fight against the enemy in the dungeon. And I love this mechanism because it's a unique take on deck building as you're adding push your luck because this deck is not only your abilities, your powers, but it's also your stamina. If you run out of cards, then you're out of the dungeon and you can no longer participate. So it's up to you to see if you can pull your way with these cards that you're pulling. So every single round, when you flip those three cards, you can discard them and draw three more, but you're burning through your deck to find that perfect hand. So sometimes Sometimes you have to just settle. Another thing that I love about this is the fact that some of the cards just aren't powerful by themselves, but will help develop and give you some engine building for later dungeons. So you're giving and taking on when you want to produce power and when you want to do some engine building. But my favorite part about this game are the way that the enemies turn into cards in your deck and you'll get stronger as you play during the game. So as you go through the dungeons, you'll fight, you'll add the enemies that you defeat to the person who deals that final blow, their discard pile. And so their deck is going to have these customized cards. And then some of your rewards for getting through the dungeons are allowing you to shift and share these cards between the other players. I love this as you're able to customize your deck throughout the experience and even cooperate and coordinate with that deck building. Another cool thing are the card abilities and effects as you're able to access your entire deck and the abilities of each card. And you know these cards are getting comfortable with them as you're adding them because they're getting added one at a time. So you can get an idea of what sort of tools you'll have at your disposal when you take down that final boss. That's my number 10. That is Heroes of Tenefer. Moving on to number nine, this is how to rob a bank. And I quickly want to mention here that this list is ranked based on how likely you are to have heard of this game. So with number one being the most obscure game here. But how to rob a bank has you playing a one versus many game where you have a bunch of people who are robbers and then one person who plays as the security guard at the bank. It's up to the robbers to get enough of these loot tokens, throw them to the getaway car before getting caught by the security guards. And they're going to be doing this through programming. Start of the round, each character is going to be playing cards into this stack face up, and then the security guard is going to be playing, you're trying to adapt based on what the players are doing. Once all of the programming has been done, you'll flip your deck over and then resolve your cards one at a time, moving around on the board. And that's got to be my favorite part about this game, is the way that the game has you programming and putting these cards in stacks, but you can adapt on the fly based on the plays that are going on on the actual board. So I love that there is programming, but you can still be tactical in your play, based on the tools that you have put down and actually committed to, and then you can still make plans on what's coming up in the future. And it's all in order to make sure that that enemy team does not get enough of those loot tokens. So being able to work together as the robbers and also being able to thwart effectively as the security guards. This one is a lot of fun, simple programming game and a great way to introduce that one versus many style of game. So that's number nine, that is how to rob a bank. My number eight goes to Triumph and Tragedy, European Balance of Power, 1936 to 1945. While that's a mouthful, 
This game is amazing. It's one of my favorite game experiences from this past year. It is a three-player only game that has you playing as one of the major powers in World War II right before it starts and through it. Your goal is to control a certain number of capital cities of your opponents or max out these different production areas or win with a technological victory. At the start of each round, you're generating resources and spending these resources on a variety of different options. And that's my favorite part about this game is the way that you have to make small decisions throughout the entire course of the game and they matter. Every single choice you make matters. And that start of round production, you can use those points to summon more troops on the map or acquire these brand new cards. Cards that allow you to make different alliances with different areas on the board, give you flexibility in your commands and how you can move troops around during the later part of the round. And then the other part, and my favorite one, are the technology decks. You have factories which allow you to increase your production or double-sided technology cards which give you special abilities to your different units. You're looking for matching cards so you can invest your action points into just drawing a bunch of these cards and then using them to get technologies, upgrade yourself, and that's one of the other win conditions is in here as well with the atomic research. And as you play the game, as time progresses, you can start copying and getting a faster rate of matching these technologies with these 1942 science cards, etc. And you'll be able to match and develop technologies because you're copying what everybody else is doing. It's such a great concept. And I love that concept of just getting a bunch of resources and wanting to spend them on everything, but not being able to. And there's definitely reasons to do so, but this technology one is one of my favorite ways to do it. So that is number eight. That is Triumph and Tragedy. Number seven goes to Kaching. This is a small game where you are trying to make the most money and you do so seven wonders style as you are taking taking cards into your hand, and when you do, it reveals more options for your opponents. Uh, every single round, you have the choice of either taking a card by paying its cost in money, putting it into your hand, or spending two cards in your hand and multiplying their values if they are the same color. So for example, if I had this two red and this three red, I could get six dollars back for turning in those two cards. It's also a way to pass when you make that exchange, and so it's about timing because the game is over when three of these columns are empty. You're trying to have the most money in your hand. Any of these stock cards that are still in your hand aren't worth anything. I love this concept. Uh, besides the game as a whole, you kind of already know how to play. I love how quick it is and how easy it is to learn. But the game itself, my favorite part, has to be what you start with. And that is this two wild. It's such a small thing. But at the start of the game, you have a two wild in front of you. And this gives you flexibility and options to make big swings when it comes to deliberately passing, when it comes to making a quick match, getting some cash right before the end of the game, or making a pair that you have lost at a certain point and allowing you to cut losses. It gives you flexibility and it's present. It's not something that you have to invest in immediately, but it's a huge choice that you're going to make during the game. And it just adds a lot of fun and tense factor to this gaming experience as a whole. So that's my number seven. That is Kaching. My number six goes to Forks. This is a game of embezzlement. You play as these large corporations who are investing money into different companies and you do so through putting stocks into this main section. Now, as the game progresses, you're going to be placing cards in the center, but also putting them in your own individual individual pile, and that's what you actually score at the end of the game. You'll do so in a Biblios drafting style, where you'll get a hand of cards, decide which one to put in your embezzlement pile, which one to put face up, but then if you are the lead player, you'll actually pass that hand to the person to your left, and then they get that same choice of figuring out which one they want to embezzle and which one they want to put into the center. It's a terrifying choice because a lot of the time, if you are embezzling a card for your own personal gain, it's not actually progressing them out in the center of the table. So it's a timing choice as well as what are the the other players going to do? How is this stuff in the middle going to change? And I love that. At the end of the game, the three largest stocks are positive points, and then the two lowest companies are negative points. So you can get some scores where you score incredibly low just because you've been taking the high cards for certain colors into your personal score pile, and that means there's nothing in the center to actually make them worth anything. Terrifying. My favorite part about this game, though, is the way it changes each time you play. At its core, there's a rule that's present, and it's a double-sided rule card that's going to give you something that's different that you'll play. One of these rules is merge. When you get past those cards from your opponent, you add those to your entire hand and then invest any card from your hand. That's incredible. So that means that you have so much more choice when it comes to what you're investing and what you're embezzling, and you can adjust based on the things that you've already taken and how the board is changing. And there's another one that's swap where you can change the cards that are actually out in the center. On top of that, each player will also have some player power that's going to change how they interact. And this game is super quick, so it's going to be one you'll want to play again and again, changing those rules, changing the powers, and having a new experience each time. Love this one. That is Forks, number six. Number five goes to 
monster, my neighbor. And this is essentially a cross between old maid and love letter as you are trying to figure out who is the monster and if you are on the monster's side, trying to keep them alive. And if you're not on the monster's side, trying to hunt them. At the start of each round, you won't know which side you're on, but if you hold that monster, you are on the monster's team and you can play cards to join other teams. And you sort of make alliances, try to figure out how people are playing as you're either looking for the monster or keeping them protected. But one of my favorite parts about this game is the way that the monsters are different. Each time you play, you get a random monster included in the deck, and some of them want to play other cards. Some of them are have immunity, so you're not sure if you've actually hit the monster correctly. So it's about figuring out what this monster is, as well as how to interact with it, and what team you may want to end up on being eventually allied with the monster, or being one of the hunters able to take it down. It's a quick experience where you'll get through those monsters that first couple of times, and it's a fun discovery process, but also has a meta that develops once you do learn the monsters and continue playing more. I like the iconography on this and the references. Easy one to play and learn. So my number five, that is Monster My Neighbor. Moving on to number four, we have Tokyo Game Show. This is my favorite Jordan Draper game. It is a game show in a box. You have one player that plays as the game show host, running a WarioWare style mini game extravaganza. Inside the box, you'll find all of these tiny cards that represent the different games that you'll be playing, point tokens, wristbands for the players to wear, as well as dice that are going to be used in these various mini games. So you're always deciding, okay, what am I going to be doing in this moment? But the person who is actually running the mini games needs to be on it because these mini games all have their own little rules and you got to know what's going on to run a smooth gaming experience. And that is its biggest negative, but also its biggest pro because once you have these down, these different mini games, this experience is unlike anything you've ever played. You're going to get into this and be like, oh my gosh, what am I doing? You are learning new games on the fly, but most of the games are intuitive. And that's one of my favorite parts here is that the mini games as simple and quirky as they are, they're also intuitive, easy to learn on the spot and play and makes the entire experience work. If all of these games were convoluted, it would be a nightmare to actually get this game played. But luckily they were able to do this amazing job with making clear to understand rules and references on how they actually work with the iconography on the cards. And there's even categories on the cards that tell you what kind of game they are. And they got a little hand if they're dexterity. You've got some where you have to be the quickest with this little fast person. And so you can even cater the experience based on who's actually playing the game at the time. Love this one. That is Tokyo Game Show. Super unique, but you got to be ready to have someone who is ready to be that host. That's my number four, Tokyo Game Show. My number three goes to Someone Has Died. This is a huge surprise to me as it's a role-playing game first and foremost, but it has a shared experience vibe where the best part of it is just being able to tell a hilarious story. Now, the theme itself is a bit morbid as one player is going to be the estate keeper and they're declaring that someone has died. Who has died? What have they left behind? And then talking to all of the people that are at the table and figuring out who they are and why they are here and if they end up deserving that thing that's left behind. Now, the game features artwork that is quirky and hilarious, but each player is going to get an identity as well as their relationship and a backstory and they're going to form who they are in this experience. Now, as you play, you're going to be revealing more things, more cards and prompts for the different players, giving them talking points. And it's all done in this arc where each player gets time to actually communicate, talk, and then even has time to get the floor to themselves and then talk with each other, asking questions. My favorite part about this game has to be these objection cards. These are these black cards that the person who's sort of running the game gets to give out to the other players and you can do this at your discretion based on if they do a job or just if you want to get somebody talking or participating a bit more so it's a great way to cater this experience to make sure everybody's involved but these objections are played almost as trap cards where you'll have one in your hand and you can throw it to somebody in the middle of any point of their talking conversation and they have to adapt on the fly to whatever happened for example if you get this objection card you're speaking with a fake accent that person all of a sudden has to backtrack, uh, get caught, maybe stumble. It's up to you, obviously, to, on how you're going to play this, but you've been caught. You're faking this accent. Why are you faking this accent? What exactly is happening? This leads to some crazy moments, and I don't really want to show all the cards here because half of the fun of this game is seeing the cards, how they interact with each other, and then, of course, the stories that you get to make up with this. I think all of the prompts are not only hilarious but well done, and the fact that they work well with each other, this is going to be one that if you enjoy this role-playing style, you're going to have everybody talk talking and enjoying and creating this unique kooky shared experience. That's my number three, Someone Has Died. Number two goes to Nessie's True Identity. This is a odd game that reminds me a little bit of a mix of Dixit 
and Wavelength, where you have one player who is the clue giver, and they're going to be giving clues, and based on what you say uh, to get as close as possible to this clue, you're going to be moving this tiny boat towards an SE. This is such a strange game because it's hard to explain. It's one where I find it's easiest to teach if you just participate, but you'll take this boat and bring it close to Nessie if the people say a word that is close to the word that you said. Uh, so it, you bring it as close as possible. These WHAT question mark that what is just a tracker for the round. So after five rounds, the person who's giving the clue needs that the team to actually guess correct or they lose automatically. So you are encouraged to actually get somebody to get the answer correct, which is why I find it similar to something like Dixit. But the wavelength is there because you are showing the relationship between your word and the other people's words that they're saying with the boat like how close you are and by the end of it you want to have people guessing correctly if you are able to get that then the final play is you say the words that were all said by the players in that last round as long as one person got it correct and everybody has to decide which one actually was correct so it's a it's a super weird game but i love how compact the package is it's about the size of a matchbox so you play with just the matchbox super limited components and it's a strange experience as you are trying to be helpful but not and confusion is created by the group that is there not necessarily by any prompts or cards this is one that it's entirely player driven and i find that extremely fascinating so that is number two that is nessie's true identity before we move into number one, I want to give a quick shout out to our channel partner. This is Into the AM Studios. They have a line of t-shirts that if you do buy using our coupon code, it will directly support the channel. I wear these shirts all the time. Right now, they are in the laundry, which is why I'm not wearing them right now. But I like the way that they fit and all of these awesome designs. If you use our coupon code SIDEGAMESTRONG, you'll get 10% off of your order and will receive direct kickback as well. Great way to support the channel and awesome shirts that I actually wear. That's Into the AM Studios. Thank Thanks again for being our channel partner. And moving on to number one, this is the inspiration to this whole video. This is Star Wars Episode One: Clash of the Lightsabers. A 1999 release came out in that giant marketing push for Star Wars Episode One. but you can find this today as redone versions. There's a Transformers version of this game. There is a Iron Man versus War Machine version of this game. Not sure why that's a thing, but the game itself is crazy good. And I think that this one, the Star Wars Episode One: Clash of the Lightsabers, is the best version because the theme works perfectly as well as it comes with these crazy cool pewter miniatures that you use to track your progress towards your victory condition. Now the point of this game is to defeat the enemy in a duel. It's Qui-Gon Jinn versus Darth Maul and you want to defeat them in the duel of the fates. On your turn you'll have a hand of cards and start of each round you're going to be placing one of these cards face down into three separate battle areas. You'll reveal your cards simultaneously and if you are currently losing the battle you have the choice to commit an additional card to the battle, and if you are winning then, the opponent has the option to do the same. You have a limited amount of cards in your hand. Some have straight numbers that are the values for actually winning the combat. Some give you special abilities and effects, and so you're trying to manage all of these cards in your hand and win two out of the three battles at least. If you're able to win two out of the three battles by the end of the round, then you're able to move up on your track, and if you win all three in the same battle, you get to move up twice on your track. Once you make it to the end of the track, you win. It's a quick experience, but I love this card play, this hand management, and trying to make these combos work as you explore the different cards. Now, my favorite part about this game is twofold. The first one are the cards themselves. They come in these standard numbers that are just raw value, and then you have all sorts of different abilities, things like drawing cards, uh, getting a random card from the top of the deck, which is super risky, and playing that out, being able to strategically pick and discard cards from your opponent's hand, doubling modifiers, blocking cards, and both players have the exact same cards in their deck, so you know eventually you're going to see some of these weird or more powerful cards. It's just a matter of time as you sift through your deck. But the coolest card is the Retreat card. This allows you to concede a battle and return all of the cards that you played back into your hand. And this is terrifying because you can bait an opponent to be playing out a bunch of cards, hit him with the Retreat, and have a crazy amount of cards in your hand moving on to the next fights. And this is the kicker. All of your cards that you don't use in the current round, you get to use in future rounds. So you can come from round to round, losing, giving up a couple of battles to build up a gigantic hand to push for a huge end 
game victory. I love that. But the last thing that's super cool about this is the way that ties are resolved. If there's a tie of combat strength when the cards are revealed, then both players will randomly play, not randomly, you'll both play one simultaneously face down and reveal. And that's a terrifying aspect because you're not sure exactly how to commit and how much you're actually going to need to beat the other person. You don't ever want to overcommit and spend your numbers uh, in a place where you don't need to because that's going to put you behind in the other battles. It's an easy to learn game. You start playing in less than a minute, but the gameplay is fun and engaging. You're always playing. It brings me that Marvel Snap feel, but in this super thematic sense, a lot of fun. So that's my number one. That is Star Wars Episode One: Clash of the Lightsabers. And you can find this game. There's copies on Amazon. I'll leave a link in the description below so you can get a copy of this, but can't recommend this one enough. This was the biggest surprise for me. How much fun this was, this little package awesome game. That is my number one Star Wars Episode One: Clash of the Lightsabers. And that's it. That's the list. Those are my top 10 board games that I think you probably haven't heard of. Have you heard of these games? Have you played any of them? What do you think about them? And which of these games sound the most interesting to you? I'd love to hear what you think. And thanks again for being here and watching Side Game Strong, y'all.